God today. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. This is an important verse of scripture which comes from the middle of the book of Revelation which in, is in many ways heaven's last word about the world we live in. And in particular this verse is in the middle of a discussion about judgment, the battles between good and evil, the end of history and how the Lord is going to make everything make sense. And this verse comes in, I heard this voice. That's how it begins. And what follows is not just any old statement. It's important because of what it says. It talks about the very things that are on our minds today. Moments like this make us, whether we like it or not, think about life and death. Moments like this make us think about the future, our loved ones and our own life. We wonder whether life is really worth all the struggles and hardship that come our way. And this verse is about that. Blessed are the dead. Happy are the dead. That's the sense of the word. We associate death and dying with sickness. Suffering, heartache, tears, all these bad things. And we associate happiness with wealth and health and fame and power. Not with hospitals, funerals and cemeteries. What's happy about death? I mean the Bible calls death an enemy. Yet yes, yeah, scripture says, happy are the dead. And the next part of that verse helps us in that it says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. This is not unqualified happiness that scripture is speaking about. Death is not blessed for everyone. Scripture says a person's with person's relationship with the Lord makes a difference. A trust in Jesus Christ, who he is, what he did, and what he promises provides a difference. That sometimes that difference may be subtle, sometimes it may be obvious, but the Lord makes a difference in how a person lives, and the Lord makes a difference in how a person dies. Yes, says the Spirit. They are blessed because of what has ended. They will rest from their labors. And that's the promise of scripture. We associate our term labor with work. We think of our jobs or the activities that we do for a living. And that's not the sense of the word. This word means the struggles or the wearisome toil of everyday life. It pictures the kind of activities that wear us down. That all of that will come to an end. They will rest from their labors. And so it's a rest from our struggles. Suddenly, the labor associated with pain and sickness is over. So are the worries and the fears that are all too common in this life. The struggles with sin and temptation and weakness. But our verse also says that those who die in the Lord are blessed because of what will continue. Their deeds will follow them. Our deeds will continue in this world. I mean, lots of things end with death. But memories don't. Teachings don't. The good times, the good deeds, the good works, the good words all linger in the hearts and minds of loved ones. 
And so those who die in the Lord leave a legacy that continues to shine bright in the lives of others for even generations. Death does not end that. And I'm sure all of you sitting here today remember Auntie Dolly. Have memories of all those things, her deeds, her words, her works. She could be cheeky. You just give us. Again, I'm not saying Auntie Dolly was a saint. No, she was like a saint. I'm sure some of you could think of times when she rubbed you up the wrong way as well. But what I'm saying is that there are the other times which far outweigh the struggles. There are those times which are out, outweighed by the love and the care and the encouragement that she showed in even little ways. The other verse or the other reason that scripture speaks about this blessing is that the deeds of God's people follow them into eternity. The Lord knows our lives, the Lord sees our faith, and nothing goes unnoticed or unrewarded. And that is what scripture says makes the struggles and difficulties of life worth it all. Jesus taught us that a reward awaits in eternity. He says that anyone who gives a cup of cold water in his name would not lose their reward. And we know the greatest reward will be the simple words of the Lord, well done, good and faithful servant. And so blessed are those who die in the Lord for their deeds follow them. We say goodbye to Auntie Dolly today. But I know that she will live on in the hearts and the minds of many whose lives she has impacted on. Her legacy of humble strength, servanthood will go on. Her memory will remain to give strength for the future. And so we are convinced and we are assured that she lives on in the presence of her Lord and Savior. And we thank God today. We thank God for her witness. We thank God for the hope that he gives to us. And we celebrate her life among us, remembering how she faithfully lived out her identity as one of the followers of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sorry, I've got a fear of falling, not walking. Who's that clapping? Old habits die hard also. I'm a fiddler yeah, when I get to clapping. the mic. You should know him, don't you know Clapton? For those that don't know me, I'm Brian the eldest Brian, son. The queen, Brian, the famous Blackie. And I thought that... I mean, we knew him sorry, let me start my watch because I've been told not to go past a minute, past ten minutes. But I did have a conversation with God, Pastor, and he said I can have five minutes. Extra. I thought before I start my eulogy, I'd keep in mind in loved ones that we have lost as a family. My beloved twin brother, Noni, with the puzzled look, and life to him was always strange and weird. He never understood the world he lived in. And his feet took him to strange and mysterious places. My brother loved walking. He loved walking. To my beloved father, Zax, as we fondly know him, I'm certain he's in heaven somewhere trying to find a politician to argue with. It's going to be a hard, hard battle. 
I did pray and say last night, Dad, maybe Mandela, not too shabby, possibly talk to him. My beloved cousin Jean, I know she's nursing someone, my sister Jean, nursing someone in, in heaven right now, rearranging the wards, rearranging the beds, because heaven is supposed to be a place like home. My cousin Glenn, if I leave any other names out, my deep, deep apologies. That's the problem with starting with names, you end up leaving people up, out. I've tried to capture the essence and spirit of my mother, and I don't type things out, so I paste and stick things, so please bear me if I find the loose pages lying all over. My mother's journey was a growth in grace, was a growth in dignity, was a growth in serenity. When you met my mother, you felt a sense of peace. When you looked at her, you just knew this is someone special. Like all mothers, I suppose. I know, Sara, like all mothers. When my mother was born, there was a kind of hush all over the world. And possibly from above the heavens, or maybe even in the room, the whisper started, and it grew louder, and it said, wow, she looks like a doll. And hence, the legend was born, and hence, the greatness was grown. Auntie Dolly. No one called him Mrs. Muller that I know of. We, an aunt of mine, got crossed at times because we referred to, to her as Dolly. She was our Faberge doll. She was our Ming vase. She was our fragile strength. And today, the journey has ended on this earth. And there's another kind of a hush as the whisper got louder. Dear, dear Dolly has passed away. And our world is dimmed, our structure, our edifice, our foundation, the very fabric of who we are is torn apart. And I know my mother, because she was a warrior, and she's going to say, my dear and beloved children, be strong, walk the walk. You are Dolly's children after all. This amazing woman grew up five children in a garage. Gordon and I were missing the other day over a few spiritual beverages, uh, as we often do. She grew us up in a garage with wardrobes separating us. And then across from the same outbuilding with one room, she literally and physically dug with the dear brother Uncle Reggie a basement flat into the bowels of the earth. And thereafter, she built a mansion for children, could each one of them have their own rooms. And people think when they see us today that we are rich, but we came from poverty of the kind you often don't want to go back to. But my mother always told us, poverty must never define you, it must never imprison you, it must never affirm who you are. You don't leave the home a poor person, you leave a home a rich person, because you're lucky to have a home. This JC plus two educator, in those days, our white government in their wisdom and arrogance, deliberately gave young colored teachers a chance to become teachers, and they called it a JC plus two, so that you could remain uneducated and remain there. But this beautiful mother of mine went back to school, night school, and the year I got to matric, she also matriculated. Oh, wow, wow. On a slighter note, she became my driving Miss Daisy because suddenly one day a brand new Opel Cadet turned up in the yard and my mother drove her down. And for the next few years until she's on 70, she drove her eldest son around, who still does not drive, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, an apology, I said if I, my notes are all over. I should have someone standing next to me to pick up my notes. I'd like to just touch on my mother's spirituality. 
I'd like to read a beautiful proverb that my beloved, one of my nieces sent. I'm not going to mention names because I'll get into trouble. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Proverbs 31. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is in her tongue. My mother had a spirituality that I can't define because I need another hour to do so. But as our hearts have a natural pacemaker, for those of you who don't know that your heart beats without it being told to beat, there's a natural pacemaker that regulates your heart. I'm convinced that in my mother's soul, in her chapel, in her body, there's a moral, moral compass deep in there. Because to her, doing right was as natural as breathing. And she could never ever understand why would people do wrong and then apologize there afterwards. As far as she knows, you should know that it's wrong before you did it. A simple value that we take into our lives, hopefully, right now. I'd like to talk to my siblings now. And this is a message I sent to, you know, families, adopt families and have families beyond our families. And I was thanking a special family that lent my mother a hospital bed at the very last minute while we were trying to find a bed. And I sent this and I said, you know, the chemistry and mysterious alchemy that connects and exists between families is almost impossible to explain and understand. It starts as a golden thread but breaks into an unbreakable chain. A friendship, a love that never keeps going. It's just there. And in our certain times, as the roots of old age start creeping around our mortal trunks, it's such a comfort to have such friends. My brothers are my friends. My sister is my friend. And to each one of you, my beloved sister first, thanks for giving us the comfort to, on, to know when I slept safe at night, when I did not have to worry because I knew mum was in a safe harbour, that mum was being looked after and protected. And we cannot put into words and ever imagine how our lives could move on and at times when your life stood still. And for Paul, to that and the rest of your family, we'll always remain eternally grateful. Spider, named after his father, a special kind of human being, you see the son, you'll see and know and love the mother. Even if you did not know the son, you knew the mother, you'd love and know the, the son. A rock, a friend, a companion in my life's journey. I'm blessed to have you as a brother with our lovely sister, Janice. To Gordon, the sum of all our parts, a model called as unbending and unyielding, will always say no before he says yes. We all know that, but that's who he is. And together, together, we are the sum of my mother's parts. Is any humanity, any love, any respect, anything you see in us, it's not just because of us, it's because of our beloved mother. Time is running out. Uh, I need to just make sure I've covered everything. My mother's philosophies were strange and unusual. And at times when I get up and speak and the year, I hear the words I utter, I claim in arrogance that it's my upbringing, or rather it's my education, it's my intellectual, I'm a smart guy. But these values come from a fountain somewhere else, deep, 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 deep in my soul. Because my mother taught us on the dining room table, spoke to us in our beds, and always spoke to us when we left home. I just want to share some of them with you very quickly. You know when you don't phone someone, and you haven't seen someone, and like people will meet me after so this and say, sorry, I couldn't get to the funeral because life got in the way. My mother always felt that is a blasphemy, because how can life get in your way 
mean, that's the greatest gift that God has given you. When you say that, you diminish life itself. And she always said, say living gets in the way. And living are the daily chores and the things we get involved with, the parties we go to and the things we blame other people for. Life never, ever gets in the way. It is living that gets in the way. I went to the tailor at least three or four times over the last few days because of my weight. I was supposed to wear a grey suit. I ended up with this not too shabby blue suit. <laughs> and men, how many of your lady friends today irritated you because they were stressed out as, as to how and what you must wear? We use stress so lightly these days. Stress is not knowing when there's food in the house. Stress is a child who goes to bed that she may be abused tonight. Stress is poverty. Stress is illness. How can getting ready for a wedding and a party be stress? And a spider likes using the phrase that I use, we have privileged stress. So today, it's a privilege for us to bury my mother with the resources that we have. Last but not least, this fine, fine educator, many teachers here, she wasn't a physics teacher. She wasn't a maths teacher because we often look up to the elite, these great physics and maths teachers, and we say they became doctors because of only those teachers. My mum was a simple needlework teacher, home economics teacher, typist teacher, but a true greatness lies in the lives she changed. And she always said the greatest gift that God gives us is the gift of a child. And no one dare diminish and negate that what God gives. And that's the true, true value of my mother. I could stand here another 15 minutes, but then we'd get late to the crematorium. My watch has stopped on uh, deliberately. <laughs> Pastor, with your, with your blessings, I'm to take charge of your church for the next minute. My wife's going to be angry with me. She calls me her character, because I just do things from the spur of the moment. I'm going to ask you to stand. You need to stand. You're getting, looking bored sitting there. Now, come on. I promise you're not going to dance. <laughs> on the last, second to last page of the hymn sheet is a prayer that I was honored and privileged to say over my mother before she passed on. God in his greatness cleared the road from Wentworth to Sydenham, and I managed to get there in time. My Bilo staff members that are here know, I do know some are here, <coughs> would know this prayer. I've just changed it around, and I'm going to ask my beautiful wife or someone to lead the prayer, and that's my mother's mantra. So we all say it loud and say it proud, because you hear the cause of Auntie Dolly. God was in her head and in her understanding. God was in her eyes and in her looking. God was in her mouth and in her speaking. God was in her heart and in her thinking. God was at her end and definitely at her part. Thank you very much, Pastor and Father. I hand over back to you. I hope I haven't taken too much of your time. My apologies, but I have. Stay safe, stay blessed, and I'll see you a little later. I think I'm on the program some to it down the line. Thank you very much. I'm going to get down slowly. Don't look, please. I'll just... Uh... What a privilege to be asked to say this tribute um, from our dear um, family friend, Pastor Raymond Clark, um, titled A Tribute to Our Dearest Auntie Dolly. I hope I do your words justice, and Corey. The task of paying tribute to Auntie Dolly is a daunting task indeed. Where does one begin? And even more daunting is the question, where does one end? With the tribute to someone so special as Auntie Dolly, 
who has lived such a colorful, rich, adventurous life that has impacted positively on countless people, including ourselves. It is a life that has left an incredible footprint. Auntie Dolly, you seemed as though you would go on being there forever, for such was your appetite for life and your desire to teach, nourish, and uplift through the medium of education and your exemplary life. It wasn't so much a matter of what you said, but indeed how you said it. God, in his amazing love, somehow gave you this caring motherly character that so characterized who you were and what you were all about. You signaled to many, including my very self, and many a troubled soul, young and old alike, that you represented a safe landing zone. You managed to say to many, not by your words, but by your friendly, warm, and engaging smile, reach out, I am your friend. Henry Wright, the revered saint of Yale University, encouraged people to use the simple yet fascinating formula to reach a higher, more decent standard of living by asking themselves the following questions as a means test. Before making any criticism or judgment on any matter or person, is it honest? Is it unselfish? Is it loving? And lastly, is it pure? Was this simple formula your secret weapon, Auntie Dolly, as you applied it to all aspects of your life? Was this your unseen anchor that allowed you to remain positive and true to yourself throughout the unpredictable storms of life and rough seas and countless challenges coming at you from all angles of life? Yes, indeed. However, despite all that confronted you, you never gave up on life, human beings. God's divine creation, you never dropped anchor. I was privileged to be at your side at the hospice in Derb 